Hi guys, welcome to our final masterclass of the Spitfire Summer School series. We have a special guest here today addressing a very important subject, how to get work as a composer. Please welcome Harriet Moss, Managing Director at Manners McDade, Music Publisher and Composer Agency. Hello Harriet, how are you doing? Hi Oli, great, thank you, thanks for having me. My pleasure. Uh, so before we start, uh, maybe you can introduce yourself and also tell us a little bit about Manners McDade. Yeah, sure, you did such a good job. But um, I'm Harriet Moss, the Managing Director of Manners McDade, and um, we're two companies, um, a composer agency and a music publisher. Um, and actually next year is our 20, so 2021 is our 20th anniversary as a composer agency. Um, and then we started the publishing company um, just a few years after that in 2006. So it's an exciting year next year. Amazing. What's your what's your role within the company? What does that uh, you know in, entail? The managing director role. Sure. So as managing director, I oversee the the two companies. Some of the teams for the two companies are quite separate. Obviously, with publishing, you have a publishing administration team. Um, but then there's lots of crossover as well. The creative team sits across both companies. Um, so I manage the teams, but also I um, because I sort of moved to that position from global creative manager um, I still definitely have a lot of um, involvement with our um, creative team and also I really enjoy working with composers on their career strategy and generally being part of um, of, of working with them and, and making making their careers happen hopefully. How many composers do you have on, on, on the roster at the moment? It really varies. Um, on the composer agency, it usually sits somewhere just under 50 composers um, from all around the world. And then the publishing catalogue um, is obviously a lot more than that. Um, uh, but I mean, we're still quite a you know, boutique family run business. I think we definitely have less than 10,000 copyrights. So I always say it's a really nice manageable amount that we can just about keep everything in our head, which to, to me is a really special relationship with the music. So you were saying you, you, uh, you're a publisher as well as a composer agency. So is that, can you tell us a little bit about that business model, why you chose or why Manners McDay chose to be a publisher and the composer agency and not one or the other? Sure. I guess I should should go back 20 years, I guess, and um, say that it was founded by Catherine Manners um, and her husband, Bob McDade. Um, and Catherine had worked in you know various parts of the music industry before, as had Bob, you know, most recently been working in music publishing. And started to work with a, a roster of composers on their film and TV career. Um, so from that, the composer agency was born. And at that time, it was really very much a sort of, I guess, a sort of golden era of film and TV where composers could keep um, a lot of the rights of, of the works that they, they that they wrote for film and TV. So naturally, the publishing company was set up to administer those rights. Um, but what's also interesting is, I guess, sort of following the timeline of the publishing company, um, it was really started at a time where the neoclassical or modern classical or alternative classical, and um, we could call it so many names, genre that's, you know, really, really prevalent today was just sort of starting up again. I guess you know, there's been sort of waves of contemporary classical throughout history. Of course, a lot of those composers were also writing for film and TV. So what started to happen was that we would sign composers just... Um, on a sort of traditional publishing deal and sometimes still representing them as an agent as well um, but we really had a roster of, of, of composers specializing in that since then of course it's grown as that genre has um, it's really grown into a lot more ambient music electronic music we've worked with really interesting rosters over the years we represented ghostly international for sync for a number of years fat cat records and we publish fabric and their houndstooth catalog um, and actually our office sits just above um, fabric nightclub so electronic has really come into it more and more i think really in the sort of last decade um, i've been there seven years so i hope i can largely speak for the last decade um, and, and, and yeah, and it's just, you know, for, for me personally, it's absolutely the genre that I love. And what's great is we have, you know, a whole breadth of composers across those two genres, really classical and electronica. And we sort of say that you can, you know, we sign people from either side and anywhere in between. Um, and it, to me, that's really the music that I absolutely love. Um, and I really think we try and stay on the sort of forefront of, of really exciting artists in, in those genres. 
Mm-hmm. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, kind of publishing and also like kind of the differences between record labels as well and how to how to get a publisher etc down the line but i actually want to start uh, right at the beginning um i get asked a lot you know how do you find that first good gig that first initial job that will kick off your career as if there was some magical door to get <laughs> through and then your career is kicked off but um you know what's what's how do you find that first initial gig or is there such a thing you know there is and I think it's really almost a few different things there's there is the first gig and the first gig's really important but you know that could be you know luck can often play a part in that as as any composer will know as to what that gig is and how um how sort of pinnacle it is in that stage of your career and I really believe that there's you know there's those stepping stone gigs and then there there is those pinnacle gigs and I think you can have um many of those throughout your career um so it's it's very much either you know we can talk about how you get that first, the first step on the ladder. And that can be a real breadth in composition. That can be assisting, that could be a collaboration really from, um, you know, if you if you went to university or college for composition, then it can be collaborating with with people that you, you know, were, were studying with, that sort of thing. I know that people come from lots of different backgrounds. So it's, it's, it's really that sort of first stepping stone. And that's really very much about um, your connections and those early relationships that you make. But then there's also those sort of pinnacle jobs that can take you from one level to the other um, and can be quite career defining or at least career defining in that sort of first first section of your career. And those are the ones that I guess are, are most important because they will not only sort of take you step by step, but really sort of um, pull you up and and probably will be from or creating the relationships that will carry you forward for the next stage of your career as well. So would you say that that first initial gig rather finds you than you going looking for that? Is it, it's probably more like taking it step by step and, and working your way towards that gig. You might only know retrospectively what that good gig was because sure. that might have opened the door. No? So it's, I, I would imagine it's hard to find that first gig, right? So. It really is. It really is. And it's, um, but I, you know, there's so much advice I can give to get it as well and that's that could be um making those connections as I say within education so if you were at a um you know a sort of quite broad um college or uni or something like that it's maybe finding filmmakers that you can collaborate with um but also there's a lot of networking you can you can do and I really understand that in this sort of um, virtual phase that we're going through, you know, not necessarily by choice, that's incredibly difficult. Um, But there are definitely things you can do, such as reaching out to um, people whose work you enjoy. That might be directors, it could be producers, it could be other composers, because I think the community is really important at that you know, really early stage in your career, um, being an assistant to other composers is, is fantastic or a music editor. You know, there's lots, so many different roles within a composer team. But it's about making those connections. And I guess early on in your career it is sort of potentially more collaborative. You you might not be sort of hired on a big TV job straight off the bat. Another direction you may go, however, is um, releasing music or, or writing music um, as a recording artist or having at least some kind of artist profile output that may be the direction you go in and, and you, you may release music it's 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 um obviously easier at the moment or nowadays to release your own music and that might be an option too because then you've got a catalog or a body of work to approach people with or for people to find you as well your profile as a as a recording artist as well is um no matter how small can be really important at that stage too. You're addressing something that I've heard recently a lot more from um, more established composers as well who, who have said, oh, I wish I, rec- I, I, I released some records earlier on or something like that. Do you believe that um, these days directors and producers start to look more for artists rather than pure media composers or you know there has been a trend a lot particularly over the last decade of that happening um but I think it's also just thinking about how anyway how a because you know if you think about directors and producers they're also music consumers how they might find your music so 
it's not it doesn't have to be so um so forced and so I guess promotional it's just where will people find you you know it's 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 just being sort of realistic you could you know the more your presence sadly it has to be on online but the more your presence is is um formulated online then people can actually find your music and and I know for a fact that directors and producers I mean, they're listening to music as, as much as the rest of us. And if they come across your music on Spotify or SoundCloud or Bandcamp's a really great outlet at the moment, um, if they're finding that, then, you know, then they're a fan of yours and then that takes it to the to the next stage. And I can't tell you how many times um, for our roster that happens. It's It's really interesting, as well as all the sort of other avenues we may approach as an agent. You're addressing a few things. I guess we'll, I'm trying to get really to the bottom, to the <laughs> bottom of it, to, to be in the shoes of someone who maybe have, has just graduated and yeah. has like no contact yet and has no social media presence. What would be like the, the very first step to undertake? Where, where, do you, where should you channel your energy? Like, do you set up an Instagram account and go wild and record yourself in a studio? Or go, do you go to all the network events or do you email all the composers? Or what would be your recommendation? I think whichever of those options is most authentic to you is, is def- you know, you, you make some really great suggestions there. Um, whatever's most authentic to you is is the route to go down. Um, so I think it's absolutely that. It's, it's networking. I think, you know, we are all in this uh, this community in this industry and the more you can know about it it's never going to do any harm to know, to know a huge amount so I'd really say research um, directors and com- and uh, producers and I mean it's, it's also such such a pleasurable thing to research watch films watch TV look up who directed them follow their career send them um, send them an email there's a really fine line of you know the networking and approaching um whilst always remaining polite and appropriate um that's for sure but I think reach reaching out to people and it's that it's that thing actually I was doing um a panel recently for students wanting to get into I guess the business end of the music industry and um I was I was talking to this HR woman and she said this really interesting thing which is people like talking about themselves so if you reach out to a director of something you've enjoyed recently and it you know, it seems like the sort of thing you might be able to work with them on. Reach out to them, ask them if you can just even have an email back and forth or five minutes on the phone to pick their brain about the creative process they go to, how they like to brief a composer, how they like to work with a composer, um, what music they like. You know, people are sort of willing to have those conversations. So I think it's very much, but it always needs to sort of come back to the creative. I think it's really important to have done your research and watch, watch their stuff to sort of be able to talk to them about that so there's definitely that avenue there's so many different things you can do networking wise as well you know spitfire put on um great events you could also speak uh, join you know the ivers academy or the musicians union there's so many different um things that are not only a support network but an outlet for all you know a number of great events or things you know like webinars and and online things like that um so, so that's a way to sort of get to know other people in the industry. And of course, you'll, you'll meet a couple of industry people at those sorts of things. And then definitely reaching out to composers as well. Again, whose work you admire, feel free to get in touch with them, tell them that, ask them if you can maybe just talk to them about their process, their career path. It might be interesting to ask um, a composer how they got to where they are and see if there's just any, anything inspiring within that and start to sort of formulate your own, your own network. Because you know, a lot of the time composers are looking for assistants, as I said, or co-writers or music editors. You know, there's there's so many elements with a te- within a team and maybe your strength is orchestration and arranging or even copying. You know, maybe maybe you can sort of offer your services, get your CV together and um, and, and write about yourself and, and have that sort of pitch ready to go when you when you meet people like that. And then there is the sort of option of of the online profile, as you say, Ollie, in an Instagram profile of you in a recording studio. I mean, that's slightly different and it's not maybe so much about getting the work. But again, the more you start to sort of release music, you're putting something out there for people to want to work with. So so that's really valuable, too. So it sounds like these days it's it's a combination of, of, of everything. And I think I can, I can only support that in my own experience as well, that it's, it's a few little things that eventually opens the door somewhere and that leads to something else, but you got to stay open-minded, I, I, I believe. I think, you know, it's great that you, 
the, you addressed that too, Ollie. You're a really good example of that, but also that it's got to be authentic. I think, um, again, that's just not something you can just um, sort of pretend at. And, and you know, I want to be a composer, so I'm going to make this composer profile and then I'm going to, it's almost, that's why I'm sort of saying there's not a step-by-step guide. It's it's what's right for you. And I think, you know, for example, you, your work as a composer, but also as an artist, it really marries together so well because it's so authentic. So I think, you know, just try not to, it's, it's sort of one of the only areas of life where you can't fake it till you make it. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I imagine if you if you literally want to be in a studio writing for, for TV mm. and that's literally the only thing you want to do, you know, you don't like the limelight, anything, then it probably wouldn't come across right if you play the live show and re- release the record just for the sake of it, right? It would probably be quite awful. Whereas if you are really passionate about that and good at it, then then working with other composers and supporting them within a team is a really fantastic place to start. If I might, may insert uh, something here, I think if you do email for for an assistantship or something, I think mm. keep it short and sweet and don't include 50 tracks and a Dropbox <laughs> link. I think like include maybe one track that you're really passionate about, that you produced, that you really poured your heart into it. And, you know, I think many composers don't necessarily look for someone that can write incredible music. I think it's also about the relationship and how you approach people. And Definitely. Because you're going to be sat in the studio with this composer you know, every day, like 12 hours or 15 hours on an, on an intense project. So yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. And it's the same as for us as an agent, you want to be able to present someone. And if you're presenting yourself, then that's great, but present yourself in a succinct, um, really, again, I'm going to use that word authentic way whilst, you know, and it's also okay to, um, check in if they don't get back to you, people are busy, but maybe leave it a couple of weeks and always be my sort of top tip for anyone in the industry really is just to always be the nicest person in anyone's inbox because composers get a lot of emails, agents get a lot of emails, producers get a lot of emails. Um, so just standing out as a really lovely person helps too. Um, so I want to talk about how how can I get my music heard? You know, what's what's the best way, in your opinion? Where do people listen to music? Where uh, where is the best way to to present uh, your portfolio? I guess as well, and uh, that leads me also to the next question: How important is a show reel these days? Mm. So, I guess as a um, as a composer, we're sort of talking. Do, should we talk as well about um, commercial releases too, or do you want to just just talk about? film and tv composition when maybe we can address both again yeah i think i mean i think a website is really important as a composer and is something that you can you can put together yourself um i don't you know it's not it's not too difficult to put something really simple together keep it simple people are going to maybe be on it for a couple of minutes and they want to read in in one sentence who you are and and maybe have like like Ollie said about the email not 50 tracks but your sort of top five tracks I mean we have that on our website for example we have our composers page a nice succinct bio photo a couple of videos and and then um a couple of pieces of music so really um show who you are and again going back to that pitch of of really thinking about who you are and really thinking about how you're different to other composers and what your sort of selling point is and then presenting that on a website is really key um having if you if you can have a, you know even just a sort of soundcloud link that people can listen to music at and it's really nicely presented and everything's quite uniform and you've got either a picture of yourself or some nice artwork is lovely you know, people, everyone on this planet is a consumer of music in some sense. And I think people are so judgmental about it now. You can't, you know, it's, it's, you've got to have those sort of basics quite right. Um, so have a really lovely page. If you've also, you know, released music, then keeping an eye on your Spotify page, if you, you know, if you've got one of those and having a bio on there and having your picture and having all your releases in order and, and trying to, you know, not have, be, you know, be completely spamming all the time, but having a really lovely output and regular output as well, because I think otherwise you definitely notice how some composers have a real peak and then they go quiet for a bit. And that obviously happens when you're working and you're on a job, but we're not talking about that now. We're talking about getting that job. So nice, regular consistency, consistency and consistent output is great. And then, um, you know, there's other things you can have like, like Bandcamp and other places to release music too. So there's a sort of 
multifaceted ways to to be really soon to get yourself out there but I do think the website for a for a scoring composer is the most important and then thinking about show reels I you know I do think they're um I do think they're still important. What we like to do is also to do them very bespoke to each project. And I think that's quite important, particularly because they're so easy to put together at the moment. Um, making them really, you, you know, if you're com approaching a composer, even to talk about a sort of apprenticeship or an assistantship, find music that doesn't sound like them and rip them off, but that they're going to find interesting that you can show um how it sort of marries with their own music you know there's again do your research listen to their music watch what they've scored and find stuff within your catalogue that's relevant to that and, and go to them with that and I think it doesn't have to be definitely doesn't have to be a visual um showreel you know audio showreels are fantastic again you might have um you could just have a really lovely dropboxing where everything's sort of organized and consistent that's great you could do it on soundcloud um you can use an outlet like disco if you want to there's loads of different options but i but i think audio is really important and one sort of please do not that i would say is that i've had um people reaching out to us as an agent and they've rescored scenes from films and you know people have different varying options about that but I personally don't find that very helpful I want to know what you've scored and and again it's that it's that sort of authentic honest thing if you haven't scored a big BBC drama then don't put your music on top of a big, a big BBC drama and just and be honest about where you are in your career and what you want we always really know want to know what a composer wants for themselves as well great thank you that's all very uh that's golden information there. Uh, Ross would like to know what are the most relevant genres for show reels at the moment. I again think it's it's got to be whatever genre you are writing. I think I you know we sometimes get approached with composers saying so I can make this 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 and I I just maybe this is just also very personal to Manus McDade but we very much want to hear your voice so coming to us and saying, okay, here's my little jazz um, tracks, here's my classical tracks, here's my pop tracks. I want to know what you sound like, Ross. I want to know how um, how we can pitch you and what we should be pitching you for and what, you know, what films you're interested in, what TV you're interested in. It's got, you know, everything's got to be specific to you. And I think, I think that's really key. I think, you know, there are composers who are very good at everything. Um, but I personally love a composer to have completely their own voice. I think I agree with what you say. And if you put yourself in a shoe in the shoes of a director, for example, the director wants to hire someone that is good for his film because the music is suitable for his film. No, not trying to write several styles, you know. Yeah, and and they're going to have a musical idea of what they want anyway. So if you're not going to be able to write what they want, then you're not the right composer. And it's that that creative relationship with the between a director and a composer is crucial and and it can't it can't be faked so you've got to sound like yourself otherwise you know when it gets down to those really tricky moments within a scoring project where you, you've you know you're having so much back and forth with the team you've got to be able to sort of stand your ground and show what your voice is and and show why they've come to you other any over any other composer uh, Floris would like to know, do you listen to anything specific in reels? It's sort of, that's like a magic question. It's, um, it, it's gotta be, it's gotta be good. It's gotta have that something about it that's unique. Um, yeah, I want to know what you sound like, Floris. I want to know, um, I want to hear your best your best music. It's also helpful if you think, okay, I've, I've sent you five tracks. I think track four is really brilliant for a trailer or um, a sports promo or something like that's really helpful. But I'm just going to be listening as as a, you know, whether you're coming to me as a publisher or as an agent, I'm just going to be listening and whether we, whether we like it and if it's got that something special, if it's, if it's unique enough to, to be able to pitch, if we think it's going to, suit a certain director's style or a you know showrunner's style that sort of thing you know so I'm it, it's that is a very tricky question because I just want to know if it's if it's good. <laughs> Showreels seem to kind of um, be in everyone's minds I think in everyone do you think that's I mean I, I know personally coming from just finished at uni like the showreel was almost everything we were working to at uni to 
Do you feel there's too much weight put into the show reels these days? Is is it really as still as important? I'm, I might repeating the question here, but it really seems to. I totally see what you're asking. It is. It's. I. Th I think it's more almost about a body of work. What. What is. What does your music sound like? So I guess in a way that's what um, your lecturers or your teachers at school are taking you towards is, is being able to show who you are what you sound like and it's that whole package thing that we're talking about it's that pitch so to me that doesn't have to be a wall-to-wall -wall music one minute or two minute show reel that can be a really lovely list of tracks or an album or send me an EP or an album you know and um, put something like that together but I can see why that is a pinnacle and I think it's important for um for schools to still be teaching that I think that's great but once you get into the start of your career it's going to be about that and the credits um but also it's going to you know it wouldn't necessarily just be the same showreel every time one of our agents would be putting together a very specific showreel with specific cues from your whole back catalogue that's relevant to the pitch that we're doing yeah i i from my part i haven't i haven't gotten a single job from my showreel i put together after uni or a single contact <laughs> or a single email or anything And uh, the, the reason why that is, 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 is exactly what you're addressing. It wasn't really me because at mm. uni you, you, you might score a comedy scene, then you score a horror scene, then you score and you kind of adapt and you're learning to do all these different styles. And imagine, yeah, someone watches and then you have 20 minutes of, co uh, yeah, 20 seconds of comedy, then it changes, hard cuts, 20 That's seconds funny. of action, you know, <laughs> and then it hard cuts, 20 seconds of whatever drama that moves you to tears. But then it doesn't really tell me much about the composer. It's like, well... This looks like a fast kind of TV advert in a way. And Whereas you can, you can score horror, comedy, drama, all as a composer, but you can still sound like you. There can be elements of everything yeah, that you that do, true, how yeah. you yeah. use melody, what instrumentation you use, your tone, your how you portray emotion, how you work with, um, you know, even just interpreting what you're seeing on screen and how you, you know, bring that to life. That's so unique to every composer. Like we all have fans of these great, great composers throughout time. We, It's when you really think about what are they good at and what do they do, you know, you can pinpoint in each composer what what, what makes them so special. And exactly as you're saying, you wouldn't put together a showreel of all their music, but you would definitely have a thread. It, the greatest hits album it is, really, <laughs> rather than a showreel. <laughs> that is actually really well put. Yeah, put together a greatest hits album of your music. That is pretty cool. Yeah, that would be nice. Thanks. <laughs> Someone is asking, uh, Rob is asking, what are the disruptors in the industry that we need to be aware of? New techniques coming? Question mark. I mean, I can talk about this from, I guess, a sort of musical perspective, but also as an agent, there's a lot of disruptors from a an industry perspective. Lots of, you know, there's lots of changes in the industry at the moment. Um, there's always going to be the sort of rise in library music and the fall of library music and... Um, Keep it, retaining your rights and giving your rights to production and and so for me those are kind of disruptors in terms of musically I think the trend of having artists as as scoring composers is is still really prevalent um, we're seeing a lot of very synth heavy score at the moment but again every time there's a you know there's a a trend like that there's also always a counter trend so some people are just going straight back to you know chamber ensembles um or single instrument scores and things like that so it's again it's a quite a tricky question because in you know in comedy there's certain trends um but also you know when you look at you can watch a lot of, of a lot of drama let's say british british drama on tv and and that can be you know it's quite synth heavy but it's got a couple of strings here and there um but i think at the moment it's quite interesting how it marries with other other sort of elements of of creative life so in in fashion in scores in um how things are shot you know you're looking at a sort of revival of the 80s and 90s and that's happening quite a lot at the moment too we've got a question from austin here are there any um certain Or are there, yeah, UK or USA film festivals that are on Manners McDade's radar? Have you discovered any composers there? Yeah, I meet lots of composers at film festivals. Um, it's a really lovely place to network. Um, I'd really recommend going to the festivals. I think it's always, 
this again it's a horrible catch 22 but it's 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 really exciting for me to meet composers when they've got something at the festival but I know that's not what we're talking about we're talking about getting the work not when you've got the work um but yeah they're great for networking at things like London Film Festival also have you know some networking sessions and things like that I'm talking about you know pre-covid times um but Toronto Film Festival was probably one of my favorites last year the Berlinale is great for that sort of thing and then you've got you know some festivals like Venice but I always feel like industry wise they're sort of a sort of very different level whereas I do think I'd say you know the best for networking in a real mix of of sort of people from all over the industry I'd say Berlinale, Toronto, um, Soundtrack Cologne, uh, Ghent, and London Film Festival, some of the top ones. So you'd say that uh, networking is is or, and attending events is quite a crucial part of of getting yourself and your music and your career going. Look, I think that's really hard though, isn't it? Because composers are so used to um, being quite isolated and working alone all the time. So I also recognise how difficult it is to suddenly go to these big events and. And look, everybody has that. And you walk into a room of full of everyone you don't know, and this is what I do for a living. But it's really difficult to introduce yourself and start those conversations. So I also appreciate that I'm giving advice that would be really hard for some people. But I do think um, that yeah, the 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 com as comfortable as you are to do it, the better. Um, if if that's what works for you, then then go for it. And I think you can start slow. You could go to things where it's just composers and meeting other composers, and it's sort of about it's almost um, something you've got to train yourself or learn is is going to those sorts of things. And again, coming up with your spiel, how you talk about yourself, how you introduce yourself to people, um, feeling comfortable to to do that at all. Um, so go to events with other composers is is a great start. And then yeah, then then start to go to film festivals or um, you know. Things like if it doesn't just have to be film. If you like documentaries, Sheffield Docfest is brilliant and has loads of networking and things like that. And some of these might have um, more sort of informal composer meetups or or look out for you know. There's lots of those different composer forums online. Or there's some things like it used to be the Women Composers Forum here in the UK, but it's now the Alliance for Women Film Composers. They do events that are open to all composers. Um, so you can really get your networking chops going because I know it's really really tricky. And then, yeah, it start going to, to film festivals and, and you'll see a lot of the same people at these things. And I think it's also about building that community and that network of people that you know that will make you feel really comfortable at these things. Talking about networking and attending events, unfortunately, we cannot not talk about COVID. Mm. So maybe you can just, I, I want to keep it short about that, but I think it's affecting the industry. And, yeah. and I would like to know your thoughts uh, about it, uh, how it affects established composers, how it might affect new composers. Is there any? Do you see any shift in the industry d due to COVID? We're still absolutely seeing how it's unfolding at the moment. Um, I mean, I'm speaking very much from a UK perspective, but it really felt like March, late March, things really started to close down. And there was other parts of the industry that that sort of wound down first. So composers who and all composers who are also artists that were otherwise in the studio or on tour were suddenly available for scoring too um and then we're sort of the work started to sort of all shift down and because we had the furlough scheme in the uk a lot of productions um we're doing just that and following lots of their staff so productions just shut um i do think they've started to open up in the last couple of weeks we're in september now um and things have started to to open up and change since regulations have have, have changed particularly here in the uk but i know that in the us there's still a lot of struggle because things are a lot more sort of closed than and, and there's obviously other countries around the world that are so i'd love to say a definite answer of what you know, COVID, how COVID's impacted us, but I think it's still very much unfolding. Um, and we're, we're going to see a remarkable change over the next six months. Um, and it's just about how long that how long that change happens for and and what the sort of lasting effects are you know there's some some composers who ha were working on projects at the time lockdown particularly in the UK happened and those either stopped immediately or you know maybe they were in the sort of perfect position in post-production where they could could carry on with with an isolated editor talking to a composer but I know a lot of composers were also maybe in that sort of sweet spot of they had you know they had everything to score to and they were just um, working on that from home but we also had 
you know, sessions that were raring to go and we had to put a hold on those. And we were the first uh, session back at Air Studios the end of May. Um, and that was sort of the beginning of things. But again, it was it was a really challenging time because it, you know, it changed how many people you could record and, and all of that. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. we're really seeing how it unfolds. And there's, you know, obviously there's a huge impact, but I don't think any of us can sort of say what exactly that impact is on on composers let alone the whole music industry and and the film industry it's it's still unfolding cool thanks a lot now i'd like to move on there's uh, several questions uh concerning uh, agencies mm. um i want to kick it off with um when is it crucial to get an agent or or maybe even what is an agent's job actually sure. when, and when do i need one yeah, um, so, I mean, it, every agent is very different. We at Manners McDade, um, we're an agent. We represent composers for all writing to, to screen. So we do film, TV, video games. Um, we even do sort of theatre and dance and things like that. Um, uh, we also do a-, a lot of advertising too. It's a huge part of what we do. And um, it's it's sort of a real mixture, I guess, as an agent. We are pitching and promoting composers um for work all the time either we're getting briefs in from our connections in the industry we're also very proactively meeting with productions meeting with ad agencies music supervisors anybody who might want to commission a composer and we're formulating um a pitch specific to them you know we we will be finding out what their tastes are what their needs are and then pitching the right composers to them Um, as i say also those briefs come through you know, there's a, a production company for a film and they're looking for someone specific and they've got, a, a, the director's got a sound world in their head of what they want. So we find that within our roster. Obviously, a lot of composers have their own connections too. And you, you've asked the question as to when is a good time for an agent. Some composers we might have been working with for 15 years and they have their own connections. And then it's about facilitating the um, the deal that happens. We do all the negotiations, all the contracts, all the paperwork. So that's probably the the time that we find people come to us um either we will approach composers that we want to represent as well and that's going to be very much based on their music it's going to be absolutely based on what they sound like and that we love it and that we love them um we only work with people that we like um but also a lot of composers will come to us at a point where they have uh, maybe a job on the table either they have a job on the table and they want help uh, negotiating it and getting it getting the deal done and the best deal for all parties because it's an extremely difficult thing uh, to negotiate particularly when you want to protect that beautiful creative relationship that we want you to have with with the director or with the with the team um so it's about getting that together but also um we will also just sort of yeah keep an eye on people that we we love their careers and um and their music and potentially we want to a huge part of what we do is strategizing a composer's career and and seeing where they are at one moment where they want to be and where we think they can be and and helping them work towards that um and that's I think you know that's probably my favorite part of the job is is seeing a composer's career thrive and grow awesome so is it a bit of a a myth that when you let's say you finish uni and you come out and is it or is it like a bit of a waste of time to 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 really only focus your energy to getting an agent when you when you finish uni to like get all the work afterwards no not at all we've signed people straight out of out of uni straight I mean they haven't maybe they haven't even studied maybe they've just been um, producing music in their bedroom we, we've signed people at really varying stages of their career but if we if we do sign someone that early it's probably because we see a real potential for them or a, a sort of space for them in the industry um, and and we absolutely love the music that's going to be absolutely crucial um you know, you can also approach agents too, but another thing you could approach is to say that you want to assist a composer on their roster because we're looking for assistance all the time. We always have CVs on file for that um, or for music editing or whatever your skills may be. So I would always say approach agents with, with who you are and what you have and what you can do. And and there will be some form of relationship. We listen to absolutely everything that's sent to us that, you know, I'm not saying everybody else does, but we, we do. And uh, we will be really honest and we'll say, you know, maybe it's just not the right stage. We would suggest, you know, working on a couple of jobs because a, a kind of crucial part of it is whatever work you bring in we then have to take commission on and, and we also recognize that you might be doing loads of really small jobs at the beginning and you can handle the admin yourself 
and you might be better off doing it doing it yourself there will be a time when that admin will get too much and the the level of negotiation for jobs and for deals is going to you know you're going to need a sort of expert in that so so we i think you'll just you'll you'll find that that time comes and also some some productions or some uh, broadcasters may require not require that you have an agent but pref- definitely prefer it because they want to have that negotiation with someone that they're a used to dealing with or b can handle a negotiation of that sort of difficulty um thank you very much that's all uh, very great uh, information um john asked a qu- asked a question what things do you need to think about before signing up with an agent and are there major differences between different agency companies there are differences, but I think they're mostly about what sort of level of composers they have um, or what type of composers they're used to dealing with. Some people might have specialities just for films. Some might have specialities just for TV or video games. You might want to work with someone. Um, so I would try, if if you can, if you can get their attention, to meet with a, a bunch of different agents and also it's such a relationship relationship so you've got to get on with that person too and I think the agent's going to feel exactly the same I'm going to want to meet you loads of times and have you meet the team and see if you're a natural fit for us and and also see if if realistically if we think um we'll be able to 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 find the work for you you know we don't want to just have you sign people to park them on our roster that's absolutely not not the key at all it's about um signing people that we that we know we can bring work to um so but I, I do think the relationship's one of the most important and I think there's so many different agents. I mean not there are globally, not necessarily in the UK, but it's about who who you might fit with more personally. But again, going back to that thing of just because this is how this this is how lots of composers start is starting off by assisting a couple of people on a on a roster. So maybe looking at who else they've got who else they've got and if you see any sort of creative holes of my music would would work really well for this agent because they don't have anything like it. I love that. I really you know, it's not great when someone will say, Oh, you've got this composer on your roster and I sound just like them. That's that's not that helpful. <laughs> Understandable. Um, so a, a very important question and subject uh, Jasmine is bringing up. Um, she's asked a question about finding a mentor. Um, she mentioned that as a woman of color, she struggles to get a seat at the table. Can you make any recommendations? Yeah, we, we did a, um, Manas McDade did a, um, a mentorship program in lockdown, actually, um, for composers for, for just that reason. Well, for, for multiple reasons, it was really to foster support and networking for composers at a really, really challenging and isolating time. But it was also to um, inspire lots of different people to come into into composition. Um, it's in terms of thinking about the inclusivity of composition, because that's also related to your question, it's um, one of, I think, the worst areas in the music industry for for diversity and inclusivity. Just, you know, there's there's um, multiple reasons for it, but um, actually Spitfire were partners on a concert we put on in 2019 called Compose Her, which which was showcasing women composers for film and TV. Um, but and as you say, particularly as a woman of colour as well, at the the you must notice that the visibility and, and the inclusivity in this area has is um quite diabolical. So I would say definitely um look out for mentorship programs. Having a mentor is gonna be incredible. Um and I've I've vouched for mentorship and everything I do and have done a number of mentorship schemes so I really um champion it and I really hope we can do another scheme because I know it was really helpful for the I think it was about 180 composers we we had on the scheme this year um so I'd really love to do that again um but yeah um, you know reach out to other composers um that you feel connected to that are working at the moment and ask if they can be your mentor like I said earlier people love um you know, talking about their career and inspiring others. So if you reach out to someone, reach out to your hero in composition and um, and ask if they will informally or formally mentor, t- mentor you or at least have a chat. And I'm, I'm sure um, they would all reach out to me and I'm ha- happy to facilitate that as well. Thanks a lot, Harriet. That's, that's amazing. Um, I would like to ask, um, we're coming to an end and uh, if you guys here in the Zoom class have more questions, please fire them away. I've got a couple more only. Uh, The first would be, what are the most important skills um, for a media composer, in your opinion? Interesting question, because I think it's, 
I always find it really nice that our roster of composers have such different skill sets and really different backgrounds. You know, some to, to be a composer, you don't necessarily even need to be able to have, you know, there's not a set list of skills. You may not even be able to read music. Maybe you're just so great at writing melodies and working with the team to to orchestrate and get things, um, get everything recorded. Uh, I don't, I don't know if you need to have a certain amount of skills. I think it's 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 really about being talented at writing the music and i think the music always has to come first you know everything everything else the orchestration arranging copying um mastering mixing uh, engineering can all be done by your team and i think the team you surround yourself with is really important it but it's about your talent and your unique talent i think is personally more important than any sort of skill and then uh this might be a tricky one um What is your best advice to make a living in the music industry? <laughs> <laughs> you can't ask that question in 2020. <laughs> no, it's um, best advice for making a living. Or you can maybe also turn it around and, and say the best advice you'd ever gotten to, to kind of establish yourself in, in the music industry. Also an interesting question. I, th I think I'm going to go back to earlier piece of advice, which is being a A, a nice person to work with. Like I said a couple of times um, at Management Day, we pride ourselves on being a really lovely team and having um, very much a sort of community, almost a family feel to our um, roster. So we want to work with personalities and people that fit within that. Um, but also if you're reaching cold, reaching out to people like we're talking about, it's so difficult asking for advice, asking for mentorship, asking for work, um, just being being lovely. Um, being lovely and being authentic. Amazing. Thanks a lot, Harriet. Uh, we've got like three to four minutes left to, to take some more questions. Uh, I can see here, uh, Jordan has a question. Uh, do you have any negotia negotiating tips for composers without agents? It's a tricky thing to do. I think um, try and separate it from the creative process if possible, because it's, it's can be two different things, can't it? Um, them be, being able to, you know, you being able to collaborate with the team creatively to then having to sort of come in as a, as effectively a business person. So even if you can distinguish on a separate email chain, you know, you've been having the back and forth about the cues, then let's have the chat about, you know, change that subject line to deal negotiation or whatever you need to. Um, And make it a completely separate conversation. Try not to tag it on to a call with the director when they say, oh, we're really struggling with the budget or um, we're, you know, the, the producers just want me to get this over the line. You need to sort of carve out time for a, for a specific conversation about it. I think it's maybe about knowing your worth on that, on that specific job. Um, feel free to talk to other composers or even just ask advice. I think sometimes people reach out to us to see if we could help negotiate on something. And, you know, we're always happy to, to offer advice as to what might be a decent fee or, um, again, you know, fellow composers will know that from experience. Then there aren't, there definitely aren't industry standards, but there are sort of expectations that people might have. So feel free to, to ask advice, ask questions, and then know your worth and stand your ground. Because I think a sort of fear with a lot of composers is if I don't say yes to this, I'm going to lose the job. But, you know, it really depends how far down the line you are. But if you are confident in knowing your worth, and I know that's the hardest thing um, to ask someone to do, but if you can, if you can do that and be confident in it, then I think, you know, I would say confidently, you, you know, you shouldn't think that's going to lose you the job. It's it's about knowing your worth and not underselling yourself is is kind of the most important thing, and seeing the value in in that amazing music that you have provided them. Uh, we have another question uh, further up by Ross. Um, slightly, well, it's a similar topic, I guess. Uh, do you come up against people assuming that music should be free or almost so? Oh, all the time, all the time. I think this is maybe more as a, a publisher because there's something about, you know, getting in touch with a composer agent and asking a composer to score something. And, you, and I think, you know, hopefully everyone can see that there's a huge amount of work in that. But for some reason, when it comes to licensing music and doing a sync deal, people get in touch and think that they can just ask for the music for free and, and it's so it's so frustrating. So I think we, you know, we just always say we cannot um you know, not value our artists like that and, and everything should have have its worth. So yeah, but it happens 
all the time. And, and you know, they may use that argument like, well, if you're not going to do it for me, I'll use library music. Well, sorry, library music costs something anyway. So, you know, um, I, I'm very, very, very passionate about putting putting the value on music too and them understanding that, you know, you're making a living, the composer's got to make a living too and, and definitely valuing music because for some reason it's quite often overlooked in a process or it's maybe last minute and and that you know that value shouldn't be taken away great um we've hit our uh, hour and um, thank you very much for your insight Thanks harriet it's been me. lovely chatting to you uh thank you guys for uh, for tuning in and uh, yeah big big round of applause for uh, harriet moss for sharing all of her uh, insights thanks so much thanks a lot bye bye take care guys see you next time <laughs>